Welcome back to Soccer Morning on NASN and Kick TV with Jason Davis. Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Jason Davis here with you. Soccer Morning, North American Soccer Network. NASN.TV, Kick TV. We left it late a little bit. A little flustered, hit the wrong buttons at the wrong times. But hey, guess what? We're on the air. That's the most important thing. We are here. We are getting ready to talk soccer on a Tuesday. Tuesday again, one of those days that tends not to bring us a lot of news. Today's news, well, t- I'll set it set up the show a little bit. Today's news, the Ballon d'Or ceremony yesterday, we find out Cristiano Ronaldo wins the Ballon d'Or, his second, first one, uh, for, uh, first one since, what, you, you, when's the last year he won it? Before Messi, we'll say it that way, uh, before Messi. <laughs> so, and he cried a little bit, it was quite a thing, I watched the, uh, Watch the entire thing on FIFA.com or FIFA, FIFA's YouTube streaming channel yesterday. So we'll certainly talk Ballon d'Or today. Women's player of the uh, women's world, world player of the year also handed out uh, yesterday as well at the same event. Although the women qu- didn't quite get the same treatment as the men, uh, it's not the Ballon d'Or. It's the women's world player of the year. The Ballon d'Or is the men. World women's well, women's world player of the year is the is the women. Uh, Angerer, the German goalkeeper. One women's player of the year. The uh, the new Portland Thorns signing. Pretty much on the strength, from what I can tell, on the strength of uh, of Euro 2013, right? Because women's soccer, I saw some people complaining about this, and I'll admit that you know I dip my toes in the women's soccer world on, a, on occasion, but I'm no expert. But it seems that she won it because of, a, of one good international tournament. That's what I'm getting from... From some people. So that's interesting. Makes you wonder if that award has completely evolved yet. Clearly women's, so- women's club soccer has had some issues over the last couple of years. But seems to be hitting a, a decent stride here. NWSL getting ready to, to get going again. Lots of news being, being made in Houston and the like. Also on the news front. Michael Bradley and Jermaine Defoe unveiled officially uh, in Toronto yesterday. Now, I watched a stream of that as well. I was all over internet streaming yesterday. Uh, both of them looked excited to be there. Uh, perhaps a little, eh, I don't know, uh, a, a, a little overwhelmed just because they had obviously both recently arrived in the city. Um, they gave stock answers to uh, to questions as to, you know, why are you here and what are your goals and what do you hope to accomplish? And what are you going to expect out of those guys? Well, we will talk a little bit more about the uh, the Bradley and Defoe moves as we go along here today. Um, we're not done quite. We're not quite done analyzing Michael Bradley's move from an American perspective. We're not quite done analyzing the reaction. I know this is meta, and I apologize, but this is part of what you get when you come here. Uh, analyzing the reaction to the decision of two uh, very good players. Let's not call them world class. I, I know people get upset when you use hyperbole. Ugh. Let's not call them world class, but two very very good players. In their relative prime, certainly Michael Bradley's in his athletic prime, and Jermaine Defoe is still a damn good goal scorer. And they could have other options, and they could have gone other places, and they wouldn't have had to drop down to the MLS level. So those things are are still open for discussion, and, and the reaction people are having is still open for discussion. Uh, also today, Richard Deitch from Sports Illustrated will join us. He is uh, the author of the Media Circus column over there at Sports Illustrated, tracking media happenings in the sports world. He also uh, formally, I don't know what's happening with it, uh, hosted the, the Sports Illustrated Soccer Podcast, or at least he did on occasion. Uh, so maybe we'll talk to, to Richard about that. And then Curtis Larson will be uh, from the Toronto Sun will join us at, the, at 11 o'clock to give us his perspective on, uh, on the events in Toronto yesterday with Jermaine Defoe and Michael Bradley. Uh, I'm seeing things like uh, Toronto FC sold out their, their season ticket allocation sim- simply on the strength of those two guys. And, and, and really, I mean, can you blame the fans? I, I don't. I certainly don't. They got excited. Um, I also have to mention here that we are uh, not quite a week. Tomorrow will be a week into our Indiegogo campaign, Soccer Morning 2014 Indiegogo campaign. We have, uh, we've crossed the 75% threshold. We are in what I will call the, the home stretch. It has been a fantastic response so far. We still have... Uh, we still have eight, nine days to go, something on the time uh, for the campaign. Um, and, and, you know, from where we sit, it, it looks great. We hope that we make the, the goal. I just need you guys to, to spread the word a little bit. If you've already contributed, thank you very much. If you haven't yet, please consider it. 
uh, and I'll leave it there. Um, and and you can, if you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to me or Trevor on uh, on Twitter or email show at soccermorning dot com. I'm on Twitter, Davis JSN. Soccer Morning is the is the show Twitter account, and we'll uh, we'll answer any questions that you might have. I'm also uh, I'm also looking at uh, some somewhat breaking news on the MLS front. Uh, it looks like uh, Philadelphia Union have traded Jeff Park, um, center back Jeff Park, to DC United for Ethan White, a center back as well, a, a younger player, and allocation um, for Ethan White and allocation to get uh, to get ahead of, or at least I'm sorry, to get ahead of the allocate to get the allocation spot. Excuse me, the top allocation spot for returning. Uh, U.S. Uh, in, U.S. internationals and Marisa Du is rumored to be coming back to MLS, so it looks like Philadelphia is in the Maurice Adu sweepstakes. So there's uh, there's your breaking MLS news. Uh, so this this Ballon d'Or thing yesterday, and if you have thoughts on this, three four seven seven five six six two seven six is the phone number. The phone lines are open, as they typically are. Um, the Ballon d'Or thing yesterday. I mean, <laughs> if you've never sat through. One of these Zurich FIFA events, it is an experience. It's, you know, Twitter has turned everything into sort of into, into a uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000 situation. Anything we watch live as a Twitter community, and I don't just mean soccer, obviously, I mean everything. Everything we watch live as a Twitter community becomes a rolling joke fest conversation. Or when you're watching a game, let's make this about soccer, when you're watching a game, When everybody's watching the same game, Champions League final, U.S. national team, World Cup game, MLS Cup, whatever, whatever big game merits a lot of people watching. And and you you watch that and the the goal happens. What what happens on your feet? It explodes. And and that was a little bit of the the Ballon d'Or ceremony yesterday. Everybody making the same jokes because there are only so many jokes in the world. And I'll admit to that. I want to be original with my jokes, but I even went back to the subway well twice with Pele. I went back. I, I, I first Pele shows up. They gave uh, they gave Pele a lifetime achievement award, something it, pre de, the pre d'honneur. And basically, what it was is, well, you weren't eligible for the Ballon d'Or back in the day because you stayed in South America and you stayed. I mean, you stayed in Brazil and, and and played your entire career there. So here's your lifetime achievement award, essentially. And Pele got choked up a little bit, and it was nice. Like I, I as a player, love Pele, but he makes the joke so damn easy. He makes the jokes entirely too easy. At one point, you know, imagine I could, you could certainly imagine Pe- Pe- uh, Pele grabbing the microphone from Seth Blatter, yelling "Eat fresh!" and and running off the stage. And he came out a, a little bit later for um, uh, for the actual presentation of the Ballon d'Or. He he read the name. He read Cristiano Ronaldo's name. Cristiano Ronaldo, your 2014 uh, Ballon d'Or winner, and, and deservedly so. I don't think anybody would say that. Uh, Cristiano Ronaldo did not deserve the Ballon d'Or. Uh, whether or not Messi is a better player is sort of immaterial. Did Frank Ribéry, with a team that won everything, did he deserve it? Look, if if Frank Ribéry had won it, I, I wouldn't complain. I wouldn't complain. I I tend to be a little like too agnostic in these situations for people. People have hard and fast opinions. Cristiano Ronaldo deserves this award. If he doesn't win, it's a joke. Frank Ribéry deserves this award. Uh, look at everything he did and everything he meant. Uh, to Bayern Munich, okay. It, it's a subjective award, right? I mean, th- there are so many, there are so many things and so many variables to take into account here, um, in 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 terms of what these players do, both for their club and for their country. That I, you know, these are these are two. The separation between them is not as as vast as we might want to imagine. It. We we look for reasons to separate them, which, which is fine. Again, the nature of a subjective award is that it's freaking subjective. You, you, you can choose uh, Cristiano Ronaldo and be right, and you can choose Franco Ribéry and be right. You can choose Messi and still be right on some level. And the interesting thing after the vote, I mean, after the award, after Ronaldo is handed uh, the trophy and, and gets choked up himself, and, uh, is, is the, the, anal- the, the analyzation of the analysis of the, the voting patterns, the, the, the actual votes, because FIFA release, releases a PDF, a document. By the way, I will say this. Uh, Grant Wall on Twitter made a very good point. Uh, they, uh, feel, they feel free to release a PDF with everybody's Ballon d'Or vote, but you can't tell everybody who voted for what World Cup bid from the executive committee? All right. A little hypocritical. 
Uh, but everybody goes through this document, and I'm looking at it right now. The FIFA Ballon d'Or 2013 uh, voting document. It's got all the captains from all of the member uh, associations, all the teams that are that playing uh, in, in FIFA-approved competitions. you got all of the coaches from those countries. And then you have media from most of those countries. I think the media vote is actually a little bit shorter in terms of numbers than the, uh, than the number of countries you have uh, for, uh, in, in total for captains and coaches. And, and stuff like, well, Ronaldo left Messi off of his ballot, and Messi left Ronaldo off of his ballot, and they voted, uh, Messi only voted for teammates. Come on. Is it really worth this? It's, it's like it's a, we're making controversy out of nothing. 202, you're on the air. Hey, Jason, it's Rick, and I'd like to talk about how the Illuminati control promotion and relocation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had a back and forth this morning. Apparently, Rick was uh, given the, uh, the suggestion of InfoWars after being only listening to, uh, to Soccer Morning on Stitcher. I'm not sure what's going on, Rick. We had to check the algorithm there. <laughs> um, you know, in all seriousness, I- I'm looking at, you know, Messi, Ronaldo, even Ribery. The Ballon d'Or is so slanted towards goal scorers, it's kind of ridiculous. You've got guys, you know, does Bayern possibly make the run that's been making the last couple of years without Philip Lahm or Manuel Neuer? Sure, and, and, it, and, and Philip Lahm got his, well, what I would call a significant number of votes for a defender who was never going to win the award. Well, no, ab- absolutely, but at the same time, why... Why are we predicating this on the flashier statistics? Why are we saying because, Ballon d'Or? Just make maybe. it a golden boot if it's going to be a golden boot. Well, okay, Rick. I mean, look, you know, th- there are players in the past, and look, Iniesta is on this. Uh, he's been a finalist. He's on this list. He gets a lot of votes, and he's not going to be the guy to lead Barcelona in scoring. So you have something of a point. I think typically it's going to be it's going to go to the guy who scores the most goals. Um, but it's, you know, that's sort of the nature of sports. I mean, I don't want to put that just on soccer. That's not, that's not something that, that, uh, that only applies to this sport. We, we give, we give MVPs in baseball to players with counting stats, uh, home runs and RBIs, or we give, um, we, we give the NFL MVP to players who, you know, off offensive players only who's, who help score a lot of points, whether it's through rushing or throwing touchdowns. And in fact, I think the, uh, the, the MVP of award in the NFL is almost exclusively the, the uh, province of, of quarterbacks. And, and you could make an argument that, yes, they are the central player on their team, but not always the most important or the most valuable. So, I mean, I, I think your beef is with sports and not just with soccer. No, I, I, I think that's a legitimate point in terms of the perception and all. But when you're looking at soccer, and even to an extent when you're looking at hockey and other sports like that, the buildup of play is such that, it's very difficult for statistics to quantify, or at least sure. statistics like goals. Sure. You know, for, uh, I, was, I was talking with U.S. Arsenal on Twitter yesterday. If, if Bayern plays Real Madrid uh-huh. and Lom marks Ronaldo out of the game and goes to score the goal and Bayern win, who's the most valuable player in that game? And uh-huh. he comes back and says it's Goza because he scored the goal. But the statistics would tell you Ronaldo is more likely to score sure. than Goethe. So sure, Tom is sure. The most you, you, you're asking people to think too much, Rick. That's your problem. You you want people to actually to do actual things. And look, I mean, I, I again, I get I get your point, but you know, the, I, I think I think that sometimes our visceral reaction can be look. There's no right or wrong here in a lot of these cases. I mean, you're talking about shades of gray as to whether or not Philip Lom is more valuable in that game for marking out Ronaldo than Gutze is for finding the one goal that actually wins the game. Because again, if Bayern Munich doesn't score the goal, they don't win the game. Then they go to uh, then they go to extra time, and who knows? Philip Lom gets tired. Ronaldo scores. They go to they go to penalties. Real Madrid puts theirs in, and Bayern misses. I mean, those things. I, I see what you're saying, but but. Again, it, I, I don't necessarily agree with Keith 100. percent But if the goal is to, if, if the if the point of the game is to score a goal, then that's got to be valued on a fairly high level. Thanks for the call, Rick. I got to move on. Uh, appreciate it. It's an interesting discussion. The Ballon d'Or. Again, you know, I, I don't I don't get worked up. I, I I I enjoy sort of the the talk around it. I don't get worked up over these awards, and I don't let myself get wrapped up in uh, in, in hard and fast judgments. But Ronaldo's a deserving winner, and that's all that matters. And the FIFA. Events are spectacularly funny. All right, when you come back, when we come back, Richard Deitch from Sports Illustrated will join us. We'll talk about media, soccer, everything else. Don't go anywhere. Soccer morning.
Welcome back to Soccer Morning on NASN and Kick TV with Jason Davis. Joining me now on the phone, Richard Deitch from Sports Illustrated writes the Media Circus column there. Also uh, hosts the soccer podcast. Richard, what's going on with the soccer podcast? That's a very good question. Uh, as always, uh, you know, I don't make a move without Grant Wall, who is the <laughs> godfather of Sports Illustrated soccer. Yeah. So we are, to, to be very honest with you, we lost our producer. Oh. who left, and since then, we have been trying to figure out, you know, what we're going to do, who, are, who our producer is going to be, and where podcasts sort of exist within the Sports Illustrated realm. So I, I hope we bring it back, and one of the things Grant and I were talking about for sure is I'll be in Sochi, so I'll be gone for a month, but we would like to do something as a lead-up to the World Cup, because I think there's a lot, I mean, you know, I don't tell you guys, there's a lot of people who are going to be interested in that kind of content and that kind of run up. So we knock on wood. We hope to bring it back sometime in 2014. Yeah, you guys are trying to figure out where podcasts exist in the Sports Illustrated world. I'm trying to find out where project podcasts exist in the general world, Richard. But uh, exactly, we're trying to fill. You know, we're filling a niche. We're we're doing our thing here. We're t- talking about soccer. Um, you had you had been uh, you included a, a note in your most recent Media Circus column about ESPN and the Mega Cast. And for anybody who doesn't know or, or isn't a college football fan. For the national uh, championship game, ESPN did, they used all of their, their available outlets, meaning all of their channels and, and some of their digital outlets as well, to give fans options as to what kind of coverage. There was a, uh, there was a raw sound feed, there was obviously the uh, title talk, which was sort of a cocktail party, watching, uh, you're watching people watch the game, um, and then there was uh, the, the, coach, uh, the, the coach's breakdown, I can't remember which, uh, what, what that was called. And and BCS film room. There right? you go, the film room, which I thought was the best part. I think most people agree yeah. with that. Um, and, and you mentioned that ESPN is considering this for the World Cup final. Uh, it's it sounds exciting. I, do, is there any other details we know beyond that? And, and, and do, do you think it could work in the same format, or would they have to tweak it a little bit? Yeah, right, a couple things there. Um, they are there. ESPN is in the process right now of examining what worked with the BCS megacast what did it, and then how they can go forward with this kind of concept. When I talked to one of the higher-ups there for the column, he brought up the World Cup, not me. I, he brought it up um, right. without me, without my prompting. So that tells me they're absolutely thinking about it. And we're only talking about, I believe, the World Cup final. And sure. I think that's smart. I'm not sure there's another soccer uh, match during the World Cup that I think would work for even a big semifinal. I think that that might be a lot. And what I th- what I think... You know, again, ESPN would have to sort of figure this out. But to me, the elements for a World Cup final megacast would be you'd have a, the natural sound of the game telecast. So that would probably be on ESPN3 somewhere with no announcers. And you just watch the game with, you know, really amped up that sound. They can do some kind of spider cam, which is a camera that runs above the field to play. That could be really interesting for soccer because that would give you a different kind of look. I think they can duplicate the coach's room with some kind of former players. I don't think, I don't know necessarily need, think you need former skippers or managers, but I think you put interesting players in a room, they're watching the game and they can diagram stuff that happens during the game um, at halftime, et cetera. The one thing, and obviously you have the regular broadcast, the one thing I'm not sure would work it might or might not would be the sort of the title talk room uh-huh. where you bring in a ton of celebrities in to sort of, you know, watch the game and comment on it. That, that can be cool because there's a lot of cool people who like soccer. Yes. But the problem with that, if you watch the college football, way too many voices, the screen was a mess. You couldn't really follow along what was going on. So they have to be careful about that. But, but I think they can do a lot of different elements for the BCS megacast I'm sorry, I, they can do a lot of different elements for World Cup soccer that they use for the BCS megacast, and, and I think it'd be interesting. It, it's, a, it's a big overlay, it's, it's a little bit more money, but I think soccer fans would appreciate ESPN making the effort if they did it. Absolutely. I mean, uh, in, in terms of the, the film room aspect of it, which again is, was the best part of the BCS game, uh, title game, and then uh, you know, would uh, probably appeal to a, a lot of soccer fans in a world where uh, soccer um, ta- uh, tactics are, are becoming more and more 
uh, ubiquitous. Uh, you know, Roberto Martinez would, he's the guy I would love to see do that. In fact, we had a little conversation on Twitter while the BCS title game was happening. What if this was ported over? Who would you want to see? Uh, yeah, that'd the, be good. the question, of course, is Richard. In 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 a college football game or any football game, you you have a stop start uh, uh, way of doing the, the the game is stopping and starting, and and they can take a moment and diagram the last play before watching the next one. I mean, less so than uh, than they used to with no huddle and the like. But soccer is continually happening. It it I would think it would be very difficult. Oh, I mean, that's a mechanics thing, and I'm not sure that that you'd have any insight into that. I'm just kind of uh, expressing how difficult it might be. Um, but probably worth it. In in terms of if ESPN and, and doing the World Cup, though, Richard, um, the, the BCS title game, they you know they pick uh, they pick all the camera angles. They they put everything together. When it comes to wor- the World Cup, and 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 I'm I have a sense that they're not choosing everything that because you have so many different broadcasters. How does that work for me as ESPN's perspective? You mentioned the Spider Camp. Do they have the option to go to FIFA and say we want to do this, or is that something FIFA includes in their package? That's the question, and I think the I think the higher ups at ESPN or certainly the production people would have to go to FIFA, explain to them the concept they'd want to do, and then it gets into uh, can they can they add these extra cameras within the stadium? You know, you have really specific contracts with FIFA that designate um, you know how much how you know what you can broadcast, where you can broadcast. Et cetera. I don't know the contract in terms of can you make the ask to add additional cameras. FIFA also has a world feed mm-hmm. that they broadcast the game on, so that's certainly in terms of a mega cast possibility. You know, you could use the you could use the world feed. Um, I don't really know the answer to that question. I do know that when I talked to Bert, this, the, the guy I talked to was Burke Magnus, who's a, the head of there. Uh, he's very big higher up at ESPN. Does a lot of stuff with college sports. Does not do soccer but as a management guy, he himself said that they would have to check with FIFA regarding the regulations of contractually what they could do to see how far they could go. The mm-hmm. spider cam wall would be awesome. You know, ESPN does not control that. It's not their event. The World Cup obviously is under the auspices of FIFA. So that's a good question, and I don't know what, uh, what they'd be allowed to do. I will say, though, that if you're ESPN – you make the argument to FIFA and say, we want to grow your game. You obviously want the American market because it is a potentially lucrative market. This kind of uh, camera angle or this kind of production will help grow the game in this country. Mm-hmm. That's the sell you make to FIFA, and then you hope that they play ball. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we've watched the evolution of ESPN soccer coverage um, you know, f- for, for some time now. And, and we went through the 2006 World Cup and the, and the 2010 World Cup, where, uh, which got rave reviews. We expect them to be just as good for 2014. Now, they've, they've lost out on the World Cup for 2018 and 2022 to Fox. And, Richard, people are scared. Um, and, and I'll bring this back to MLS here in a second. But people are scared of what Fox is going to do because we've come to expect excellence out of ESPN at this point. Obviously, they're the... Uh, you know, you know, they're the big dog in terms of, of producing uh, sports television. It, do you see, and, and I'm sure you've watched uh, the Champions League coverage and the like from Fox, uh, what, do, what do you see from Fox in terms of their soccer coverage and, and where do they need to go to improve a product, product that, at least in terms of the, the hardcore soccer fan, is not quite there yet? I think, I, think, I think soccer fans have a right to be worried about Fox, to be very honest. They haven't at this point given you any kind of assurances that they're going to have the same quality of World Cup coverage as ESPN has. Now, I don't think they're an amateur network. We're not talking about, like, be in sports where, you know, you, you sort of need binoculars sometimes to see the left play of the field from when you're sitting at home. But, um, but I think that's a legitimate concern from soccer fans. Where I think they – what I think Fox should honestly do is I think Fox should really pay, and I'm sure I hope they have, very close attention to what NBC has done with the Premier League – and how they've covered that from their studio show and the smarts that the studio show does to the level of quality production that they do from even a, a small touch of you know going live when the players walk out onto mm-hmm. the field and sometimes not announcing or saying it you know no basically letting natural sound take over when the players walk onto the field for um, for Premier League coverage. Uh, I think Fox, for one has to seriously think about what, what are, who our broadcasters are. I, I, Gus Johnson, I don't believe, is going anywhere. I know he's, he's in, in your world, major figure of, um, of controversy, <laughs> but yes. Gus is going to be a player in the World Cup. I believe he's going to call the U.S. games. 
I don't know if he's going to call the final, but he's going, he's going to be there. Fox has invested way too much in Gus Johnson at this point to remove him. But I do think that you can make some really smart moves outside of Gus to bring in quality, experienced soccer play callers, mm-hmm. as well as experienced and quality analysts, which Fox has not shown at all yet to, to you know, they have a revolving door with Gus. And, and that will help, I think, because ultimately, you know, I'm confident that Fox will provide good pictures. I mean, I think they're going to spend so much money to make the production uh, fairly high quality that I think you... I think they really need to focus on the talent because so far what, where they've been really crushed on um, is talent. They, mm-hmm. People don't believe that their game callers and analysts are up to snuff compared to ESPN and Ian Dark, et cetera. And generally speaking, their studio shows have not gotten any traction. I mean, they just put their, they just put their Fox Soccer Daily on hiatus for a while mm-hmm. because it wasn't getting audience, and clearly they have to figure out how to rework that to get people interested. So... They have a long way to go. I, the one thing I would tell your listeners to sort of key on is when they get the World Cup in 2015, the Women's World Cup. Mm-hmm. I think I have my date right on that. Um, that's a that, that's that's the first test, and you'll kind of see how how in depth they do soccer coverage from game presentation to surrounding that tournament with a lot of interesting studio programming. And you'll have a sense of how far they have to go to 2018. But but that's really what I'm going to be watching because that's their first real test is, you know, how do they cover the Women's World Cup and what kind of sort of soccer DNA do they have as we then look forward three years? Yeah. Um, but Fox has a ton of money, and they will be able to have watched ESPN in 2014, so they, they will have a blueprint, and, and those, I think, are ultimately good things for soccer fans. In, in terms of those big one-off uh, tournaments, those those short time frame tournaments, I mean, that, that clearly... Um, a concern for fans, but in, in for MLS fans in this country, there's also um, the very real possibility, the rumors are out there, Richard, that Fox is going to replace NBC as an MLS broadcaster starting next season. Uh, this reportedly involves a, a very large increase in money for MLS, uh, which is, a, a, you know, it's, it seems like found money for a league that has terrible TV ratings. If Fox is willing to pay it, that's great, but from a production value standpoint, we want to see them uh, present the league in... in uh, a very positive way, the, the way that NBC did. I mean, you mentioned um, letting the game speak for itself and, and the procession and everything else. NBC does that for MLS and makes MLS feel like a big-time event where we know MLS has a long way to go um, on, on that front. And, and to the point of, of the rumor of uh, $70 million plus uh, a year average deal between uh, Fox and ESPN for MLS, would you have any insight, I mean, provided that this is not confirmed anywhere yet, but would you have any insight as to why MLS would be able to get that sort of money out of ESPN and Fox, and I don't know who's carrying the lion's share, um, despite really bad TV ratings on NBC and ESPN this year? Well, I saw the story, too, in the Sports Business Journal that uh, the new MLS deal with Fox ESPN could be worth $70 million annually to MLS. That would be great money for MLS, obviously. Sports Business... Um, Daily, I have a lot of respect for those guys. Don't get stuff wrong, so I would figure that the numbers are correct there. My my sense would be that that is a correct story. I think you have to look at it twofold. If you're Fox, you're looking at it. We want to invest in soccer. We want to let viewers know that we are a legitimate soccer player. So we are interested in MLS. Keep in mind, Fox Sports One needs programming. Yes. So that that's a real that's a real factor here. Is that's a, that's a professional league that you can put on your new cable channel that continues to um, acquire rights and ultimately the ball game is you want to tell distributors, Hey, you know, Fox sports one covers college football, college basketball covers UFC covers MLS. That, this is how you get more money out of the distributors because they have to have your channel because the theory is that viewers have to have that channel. So mm-hmm. that, that's where the Fox angle I think would be is that you would over, I mean, they overpaid for God. Fox is overpaying for rights now because they're trying to build this network. So right. they overpaid mega massively for the U S open golf rights. I would say here, not knowing the market perfectly, but just sort of taking an educated guess, they're overpaying for MLS rights based on what the ratings are. ESPN wants a soccer foot um, foothold because they have lost the world cup. They have a long, history with soccer fans. And I think the reason if you're them, you would want to keep MLS is because there's not a lot of packages available. I mean, NBC grabbed the premier league, Mm -hmm. although ESPN, I don't think bid on it. Interestingly enough, Fox has the world cup. So you want, you know, you want to be a soccer player. And right now to be a soccer player, the only rights available are 
the MLS rights. So again, your your thought process is correct. I mean, the the <laughs> the viewership numbers. I you know I'm looking this right from the Sports Business Daily story. The audience for 20 MLS matches on ESPN and ESPN two in 2013 drops 29 percent. Mm. I mean, that is a massive drop. NBC Sports Network only averaged 112 thousand viewers this season those are really bad ratings for a major sports property but the thought you know again fox needs this for programming and i think espn wants to sort of keep a foothold in soccer they also have a lot of people there including their president john skipper who believe in soccer right so i think also some of this is i wouldn't call it a vanity purchase but i think some of this is because there are there are serious management players at espn who believe in the sport which ultimately is great for uh, the people in this country who love the sport because you need ESPN to believe in your sport or it's not going to be a player in this country. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of those guys that's, uh, you know, interested in sort of the uh, the larger conversation in this country when it comes to sports and where soccer fits in and, and having been a, a soccer fan, you know, for some time, sort of, I've always said, you know, when you get soccer into the, the general conversation, if we see... Uh, <laughs> if we see your favorite people on first take debating some really? soccer news, Richard. Yeah, so I was having such a good morning. <laughs> you, you had to drop. That. Uh, well, right, no, 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 I mean, I, I look whether or not you like that show or you like that that the the embrace debate feeling of ESPN. There's certainly something to be said for uh, let, let's let's bring it to sports talk radio. When when soccer is legitimately discussed as a serious thing on sports talk radio, whether it's the local MLS team or you know the Champions League final, then then we know that we're that that soccer's really got a foothold. But in the, for the time Correct. being, it's a matter of sort of clawing out what you can and needing you know needing people like John Skipper in place to help the sport along. Maybe when the popularity or the the numbers don't necessarily justify some of the places that that soccer gets, which is why when you go when when there's something on ESPN that's soccer related, you go to Twitter and it's. Uh, you search the, you know, you search soccer, and you'll find a, a, about a thousand people saying, "Why are you forcing soccer on us, Richard?" Do you get the sense that that's the case, though? That there's some sort of, you know, I'm not that that there's a vast conspiracy, but the notion that that soccer is being, you know, sort of force fed just a little bit in in in, in the sense that it it isn't uh, most it isn't popular enough to justify some of this. Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's no doubt that ESPN um, has a vested interest in trying to make soccer popular in this country, or at least they have had with the 2014 World Cup. So there's no doubt that, you know, listen, this is the t- t- television absolutely will try to throw stuff down your throat because they either believe that it will draw ratings or it's going to ultimately help other things within that organization. I mean, they, ESPN shoved Tim Tebow down people's throat, not because it was a legitimate news story every time. It was because they knew that they could draw eyeballs. And I can guarantee you this, that come World Cup time, you will see World Cup talk on Around the Horn, Pardon the Interruption, ESPN Radio, far more than you've seen it at any other time during the year, because that is how ESPN's multi-platform approach uh, is. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing for soccer fans. In fact, it's a great Mm -hmm. thing. But it does tell you a little bit of the manufactured nature of all this stuff. They have invested a lot of money in the World Cup, and they are going to, trust me, whether they admit it outright or, uh, and they should admit it outright, they're going to tell every one of their platforms that, hey, this is a major initiative for this country. We want you guys talking about this this Mm -hmm. month. So, um, yeah, what would be the key indicator is when you don't need a special, uh, you know, when you don't need that kind of memo, for soccer and soccer is just part of the sports talk landscape. I think it is in certainly some cities in Seattle. I bet you sports talk has a ton of talk about soccer and I bet you, you know, come world cup time, whether it's Miami and some other cities, Mm -hmm. that'll be a natural conversation. But, uh, but yeah, still for the most part, soccer gets a little force feeding, um, when it's not, you know, really, really prominent in terms of the public discourse. Yeah, the, I suppose part of that too is, um, you know, it's chicken. You know, part of that too is the people involved in the decision making as to what's going to be discussed. And I don't just mean at ESPN, but I mean in in general, we're we're seeing a generational turnover in a lot of places that will affect how much soccer gets talked about. Uh, but you mentioned, I mean, we're talking about ESPN, we're talking about their push, and and you know, I'll ask you if if losing out on the rights for eighteen and twenty two affect how they approach this particular World Cup. But in the lead-up, we're going to have uh, their, their celebrated 30 for 30 uh, documentary series um, uh, approach soccer in, in a number of different, with a, with a number of different pieces, uh, some feature length, some from some shorter. 
um, it, it, that kind of that kind of investment and sort of that kind of discussion. And a lot of this stuff is, you know, it's a lot of political, uh, you know, stories of, of political uh, politics and soccer combining and and sort of a a. A, a wide world perspective on this. There's not an American soccer story in the mix. And I know they've done a couple of things. Um, the 99ers, for example, but is that, is that indicative of anything? Or is that just, I, I don't know, as an American soccer fan, Richard, I'd love to see an American soccer story get told this summer. Uh, listen, I, I understand that, but that, that really doesn't bother me to be very honest okay. with you. Um, I, I would rather see them do, um, I would rather see them do the most interesting stories that they can do. Now that doesn't mean maybe I'm, there's no doubt that there are interesting American soccer stories, but you know, I, I don't think they should, I don't certainly believe that filmmakers should be sort of designated that, Hey, you have to tell us a U.S. soccer story no, no, as no. part of our 30 for 30 no. coverage. The one thing, the larger thing that you mentioned, and it's a good point is I don't believe they're, I believe the opposite. I believe they want to go out with the greatest world cup coverage ever. Okay. So I think they're going to throw everything under the sun at viewers and try to make, when the World Cup ends, you're like, man, nobody's ever going to do a better job covering the World Cup than ESPN did. That's what I think they want you to walk away with. It's even though they lost the rights to 18 and 22, this is not going to be a hey, we're a lame duck. We don't really care about this tournament. I guarantee it. They're looking at it the opposite way that we want you to remember how great this coverage was, and now we put it on Fox to try to come up with what we just did over the next two World Cups. Yeah, and, and, and I don't think uh, most people are confident that, that, will, uh, that Fox will match it. But and last thing here, and, and this is more of a general, general musing than a, than a question, it, what will ESPN, ESPN do? I mean, they're still going to have MLS. Um, I've heard that the Bundesliga is going to come back to wide, widely available American television, but on Fox Sports 1, the Premier League rights are locked up for NBC for, for quite some time. What is Once this World Cup is over, what does ESPN do on the soccer front outside of their MLS Game of the Week? They're going to wait in the weeds. They're going to grow. They're going to build, <laughs> create that giant. No, they're basically, yeah, they're, they're going to they're wait. They're right. going to they're they're chill out. They're going to continue to, you know, use cash their ATM checks that they do every week and wait for some of these rights to be available. I, there is no doubt that they want back in the World Cup. I guarantee that. So when those when those rights fees become available, they will be a player. Will they get it? I don't know. Um, you know, Fox overbid for the uh, oh, I, to be blunt, yeah, Fox overbid for the World Cup, but they needed it. So I understand that that bidding. Um, so ESPN I think will be back in the soccer business again at some point uh, beyond what they are now. I think they just have to wait for Right fees and financially, that, that's not the worst place for ESPN because you have to remember. Think of how much they just paid for the college football playoffs. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, listen, they're the most successful sports business, you know, sports, sports television business ever. But everybody does have a money limit, so oh, it's we've not the worst that. thing in the world <laughs> for them to sit back for a little bit when it comes to soccer rights right. and ride out a couple of years. But they're not, they, you know. I guess I would say this: if John, as long as John Skipper is the president of that company, they they will be a factor in, in future World Cup bidding. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they bottom lines matter, and we've we've seen that very recently with ESPN and 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 some of the uh, layoffs that they've had. And, and let me just say this before I let you go: the MLS or uh, ESPN has indicated uh, a rising interest in in the Mexican product as well, which is obviously very, very popular here. They put yeah, on smart. They uh, want Hispanic. Uh, they want to increase their Hispanic audience. That, that yeah. would make a lot of sense. Yeah, we got Richard Deitch from uh, Sports Illustrated joining us talking uh, soccer and media. His uh, media circus uh, column at, at Sports Illustrated. Definitely go check that out for that mega cast nugget among some other soccer stuff. Martin Tyler's mentioned. We didn't really get to that, but perhaps another day. Thanks for your time, Richard. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks yeah. for the invite. I appreciate that. Uh, excellent chat there with uh, with Richard. Uh, let's take a break quickly. Just uh, reset my brain. We come back. We'll talk about Clarence Seedorf taking the AC Milan job and maybe a little bit of immigration and the U.S. Men's National Team. Don't go anywhere. Soccer Morning, North American Soccer Network, NASN.TV.
Welcome back to Soccer Morning on NASN and Kick TV with Jason Davis. Back on Soccer Morning. Thank you again to Richard Deitch from Sports Illustrated. Fascinating conversation. We'll definitely have to bring Richard back uh, in the future if there is uh, if there is reason to. There's always something happening in the world of of soccer and media in this country, uh, especially. Um, it's a fascinating sort of area of of the game. If if you decided to just do, and I know we've got some some sports business blogs. Uh, we've we've done we've had some guys on uh, Chris Savino from um, uh, from soccer business blogs and, and the like. I know those exist, and, and and sort of media stuff falls in under that heading. But sort of the the approach and and more of the conversation of where soccer coverage is going in the United States, some of the battles taking place over rights. That stuff is fascinating to me. And I, and I know there's not always fodder for that, but if you had just that little corner of of the soccer world to yourself. I don't know. You might be uh, might be successful. It might be time to start a new blog. I haven't started a blog in six years, five years, five and a half, whatever. Five years I haven't started a blog. I've only started one blog. All right. Uh, we are uh, we are sort of moving along here. The the news Clarence Seedorf is going to take the AC Milan job. You heard that yesterday uh, from our friend David Amoyel. Uh, that was going to happen. He is retired as a player and will effectively effective immediately take the AC Milan job. I find that that path fascinating. Clarence Seedorf, who obviously was a, a fantastic player for AC Milan, ends up in Brazil on the tail end of his career playing for Botafogo and. You know, from all reports, playing fairly well. Not, you know, he's clear. He's, he's, you know, he's up there in age. He's, he's a player on the verge of retirement. And instead of, again, AC Milan, instead of going after someone with a track record, instead of looking for an experienced coach, they trade on the sort of the goodwill that Clarence Sato will bring as he steps into that job. It, it's, it's sort of a referendum on how important managers, managers are. That, and I'm not saying that Clarence Sato can't be a good coach. I'm saying he has no experience doing it. And if he comes right in and suddenly AC Milan are much better, what does that say about the experience that coaches have? What does it say about what they bring to the t- Is it important? Is, what, is, what is it that makes a, a head coach successful? And, and we laud them, and for, rightfully so when they are successful. Uh, when you're Alex Ferguson and you win trophy after trophy after trophy, then you know, we, we, we obviously um, are going to celebrate that. When we see a coach impact a team to the, to the extent that it takes on a, a distinct personality and becomes his team and, and his manner of playing is, uh, is, is clear and, and, and present. And, and whether it's this player or that player or this lineup or that lineup, it stays the same. That, that stuff gets celebrated. Jason Christ is held up as, a, as an MLS standard because of what he did at Real Salt Lake. And now we get to see if he can do it at NYCFC. Speaking of NYCFC, I know we talked to Dave Martinez from Empire Soccer yesterday a little bit about uh, the presentation of Jason Christ to the media there in New York as the first head coach of, of that club. Um, if, if you're looking for a little bit more background on that, um, well, first of all, go to EmpireSoccer.com for any New York-related stuff. Uh, but I also read this morning, I finally got around to reading uh, Leander Shalakin's piece on, on that event. A- and rather than you know, rather than focus on directly what was said, um, you know, to or 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 what or the stadium issues or anything else that was sort of um, ancillary to uh, to what they were trying to get done. Leander focuses on New York City FC's clear and stated goal of playing, you know, Barcelona style soccer, playing attractive soccer, being a certain type of team, and then success will come. Will come. And it's, uh, you know, Leander lays out a very strong case that, that New York City FC is doing something that MLS teams haven't done before. And that's starting from scratch with this notion and uh, having all of the resources to follow through on it, where you might get a coaching change in MLS and, and said coach may step in and he may say, well, I want to play, you know, I want to play, I want to play attractive soccer. We want to play extra- attractive soccer here. And then, uh, you know. Uh, we'll play attractive soccer. Uh, we want to entertain the fans. Blah, blah. Everybody gives lip service to that notion. Every coach ever gives lip service to that notion. Even if they, even if their previous resume indicates that they like to pack the box and, and, and play on the counter, they'll tell you when they get a new job, they want to play attractive soccer. No one's going to say, I want to play unattractive soccer. Hey, hey fans, guess what? 
We're going to play some ugly ass soccer, but we might win a few more games. Nobody's going to do that. They're going to set it up as uh, they, while they are before they even step on the sideline to coach a game. They have that deny the plausible deniability. Oh, well, you know, I tried. I tried, but our personnel is not good enough. So we decided to put 10 in the box. And now here you go. Here's your soccer. Oh, look, we might have won. You know, maybe we can win a couple more games. Maybe we can make the playoffs this season by the skin of our teeth because we played ugly soccer. They're not going to tell you that. So I'm interested. They obviously picked the right coach in New York. Jason Christ is the right coach to do this. And they have clearly made it a, an investment in American talent from that regard. Technical talent. Claudio Reyna, Jason Christ. Now they have the resources. And now they're going to step back. They're going to go through their build-up year. And in this piece, the nice little nugget here, towards the end of the piece, now that they have the philosophy in place, NYCFC believes in finding the right players. 36 city scouts are already scouring the globe for the right players, primarily in South America, according um, according to uh, the president. Uh, I'm not going to butcher his name. But the right set of tools and the right mindset. So I'm, I'm curious here. And, and this is obviously part of NYCFC and, and everything that they bring to the table via their Man City backers. Is there another MLS club that has 36 scouts available to now? I'm sure these scouts are also looking for Man City players. They're, they're probably doing double duty in that regard. They're, they're looking for, for players for, um, for the organization, meaning both clubs. Oh, look, here's a young player. Um, he's not ready to come to, to England or for whatever reason, let's, let's make him an MLS player. Let's take him up to New York. Maybe that's what's happening. But 36 scouts, that's a lot of scouts. That's a, that's, that's a significant advantage. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. All right, let me, let me take a, a little bit of a left turn here. Uh, by the way, Curtis Larson from the Toronto Sun will join us in about 10 minutes to get his perspective on yesterday's uh, celebrations. Jermaine Defoe, Michael Bradley unveiled there in Toronto. We'll talk... Uh, with, uh, with Curtis about that event. Um, going forward, what it means for Toronto FC, perhaps some of the fallout over the amount of money that Toronto's spending, which is interesting. But I came across this article uh, on, at Law in Sport. This is what my newsreader does, people. Follow, this is why you should follow me on Twitter. Davis J has said, just, just for the fact that I will occasionally tweet out an interesting article that I find in my newsreader. It happens. Lawinsport.com. Your headline, U.S. immigration policy negatively impacts U.S. soccer. And the article is what it sounds like. It is a case for, uh, for fixing U.S. immigration policy, partly because it hurts the United States soccer team. And uh, a couple of the examples used, uh, Diego Fagundes, who I think most U.S. Uh, American MLS aware fans would love to see playing for the United States of America. And I'm sure, and, and in fact, Diego has stated on several occasions he'd love to play for the United States, but he is not eligible. He just uh, just got his green card, and now he's got to wait five years. Same thing with Darlington Nagby, although Darlington Nagby's uh, time between green card and citizenship is shortened by the fact he got married to an American citizen. And by the way, congratulations to Darlington Nagby. I think he just had his first child with his wife. Um, so the article goes into some of these issues that uh, affect whether who's eligible for the United States and who's not. And, and the amount of time and sort of the, the hurdles that have to be uh, jumped over in order for these players to become American citizens because U.S. soccer policy is you have to be an American citizen to play for the United States of America. Now, that is not necessarily, you don't necessarily have to be a citizen to play for other nations around the world. If you've, if you've been confused by the fact that some player who was in a country for two or three years playing um, with a club team suddenly got a, uh, got a passport and then showed up on their national team. And wait, 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 wait. That, that was like they just got there like yesterday. How are they playing? Th this is because everybody else has different policy. Everybody has different policies on what they, uh, uh, who's eligible for their nation. The USF, uh, USSF policy, U.S. Soccer Federation policy, is actually stricter, stricter than what FIFA, which oversees international soccer, requires of its members' associations. That's from the article again. In fact, the FIFA statutes do not even mention the word citizen or citizenship. FIFA Regulation 5.1 states, any person holding a permanent nationality that is not dependent on residence in a certain country is eligible to play for the representative teams of the association of that country. Now, again, what does permanent nationality mean? 
then there's some some discussion over uh, how the United States government treats nationality versus uh, versus citizenship. Clearly, there are issues in international soccer over naturalization. We've talked about some of those things here. When Aaron Johansson, who is an American citizen by virtue of his birth in Mobile, Alabama, can play for the U.S. Uh, United States of America, but Diego Fagundes, who got here when he was five, cannot. These things are going to be discussed. We want, we want people, and, and, and I'll say this, and, and this is no slight against Aaron Johansson, because he made his decision, he seems committed, there's no reason to question him. And the same goes for anybody who didn't grow up here but is an American citizen and chose to play for the United States of America. I'm not questioning uh, their commitment to the United States or, or how American they feel. But the, the, pro- the problem with international soccer is that it inflames those passions, right? You're, you're an American. If you are only an American or you're an American with, uh, uh, you know, your, your parents are from another country, but you identify as American, you, wanna, you want players who want to be American. But the rules, as they exist, allow for these little, these little exceptions. Aaron Johansson is an exception. Again, not questioning his motivation, just saying the only reason he's eligible is because his parents were in school at the time in the United States, whereas Fagundes, who has grown up in, in an American locale for the last 13, 14 years, is not. 270, you're on the air. You're making a lot of noise. What's up? Hello? Uh, and then you hang up. You call my show. You make a lot of noise. And then you hang up. Uh, Fernando on Twitter, Junior Doc 75 Mick Hoban played for the USA on August 5th, 1973 as a UK citizen. And look, going back to the, the 1950 World Cup and even further to the first World Cup in 1930, the United States had non-American citizens playing for the team, guys who were, were, who were immigrants here, who had been here for 10, 5, 10, 15 years, uh, who were from Scotland or England or wherever, who played, uh, played for the United States. I, think, I don't even think Joe Geichens was an American citizen, right? He was, a, he was a Haitian citizen who was living in New York at the time. So, but the rules have gotten tighter and tighter and tighter. And as the rules have gotten tighter, clearly, and, and here's what I need to know, and we need to find somebody. And something I wasn't able to find just with my cursory Googling research. Is U.S. soccer's policy based on somebody else's policy? Or is this a policy they came to on their own? I'd be curious. What's the, uh, what's the USOC policy? What's the, um, the U.S. Uh, Olympic Committee policy? Because I know that we've had, we've had naturalized um, Americans represent the United States in the Olympics. So, I mean, clearly, you know, you, that, I mean, whatever. You can represent one country and then switch, I mean, and then get your, get your U.S. citizenship and represent the United States, whereas that's not even possible in soccer because once you're, once you're cap tied to one nation, you can't play for another one, even if you get the citizenship. So I, I'm, I'm a little confused as to where, why U.S. soccer's policy is as strict as it is. Or Look, I guess the question is, do we want, U.S. soccer's policy to be to be more lenient. Two seven zero. Are you are you done doing the dishes or whatever? <laughs> yeah, I had a had a bad connection there. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, no, my point was exactly what you just then got to say. That's the problem with calling in, having a little delay. Um, but yeah, the the problem isn't the wall, as the article tries to to use the point to um, examine. But it, the problem is the policy with the national team. Or with the uh, federation. Well, okay. Let me let me ask you this because I I mean I look this is an open question. I think we need to talk about it a, a little bit. Where's the line? I mean, where do we want the line to be? I look. I I think citizenship because it's a very black and white barrier is a fine uh, requirement in that sense. I mean, the pro. Okay, look. You you say the problem is with the U.S. soccer policy and not with the yeah. law. That's that's fine. But the law is also the the U.S. requirements for getting c- citizenship are particularly drawn out and strict. Uh, because uh, take right. for example Fagundes, who again mentioned in the article, and I know you've uh, clearly you've read it. But why not the green card? Why is that not enough? I mean, if we're saying, hey, you can legally be here, you're here, you're just not completely through the process I, yet. I, I, I mean, if you're going to legally be here, and then shouldn't you also be I, legally I don't know. to represent? I, I don't know. Again, I mean, I, I I need to do a little bit of research as to why U.S. soccer has the citizenship requirement. And then, yeah, again, I mean, is, is a green card in, enough? I mean, does that indicate, okay, look, you're, you're on your way to citizenship. So we'll go ahead and, and make you eligible. Um, you're a, you're a permanent American. The, the problem is again, if the law says that you have to be a, you have to have a green card and be here for five years consecutively, or, you know, with the, with the, the breaks being very small, 
when you're out of the country, then maybe that's why the requirement of citizenship from the U.S. soccer perspective. Because if you had a player like Fagundes, he gets a green card. Okay, Now he is 18 years old. He's got a green card. He represents the United States. But he goes and and you know signs the club in Europe and, and never comes back and never gets his citizenship. I'm not saying that would happen, but just as a hypothetical, does that sort of... Um, hurt the 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 cause? Or does that make the U.S. U.S. national team look? I don't I don't know. Uh, again, a lot of questions. Yeah, I, don't, I wonder if I wonder if you get a green card and you leave. If you come back, are you already automatically? Do you get your green card if you come back, or do you have I to go know. restart the clock? That I think be interesting that's a very good it. question. Uh, we need an immigration lawyer on this show, Perry. Thanks for the call, man. I gotta go. I, I, I don't I don't know. Does the clock restart? Do you? Uh, I do know based, and again, the only reason I know anything about immigration law is because of soccer. So there's some, at least there's something to be said for the fact that we are all now nominal immigration law experts, not really, but we at least know the law a little bit because of our soccer players. I know that the United States lost that on Euromov as a as a U.S. national team player because he decided he wanted to go chase a dream in Europe and, and more power to him. Um, I know that if Diego Fagundes is sold or has an opportunity in Europe and leaves before his five years of green card uh, of having a green card or up, then he won't become a citizen and he won't play for the U.S. national team. Same thing goes for Darlington Nagby, although, um, you know, again, his time frame is shorter based on the fact that he's married to an American citizen. I it's 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 strange, and and, and again, uh, maybe I'll get back to this at some point in the future because when you talk about a player like Aaron Johansson and the debate we had with the Icelandic uh, FA president, he was not. He was not brought up in an American soccer environment. He was brought up in an Icelandic soccer environment. So by, by rights of, uh, of development, you would think he's an Icelandic player. But he is eligible for the United States, and he's playing for the United States. Do we need the U.S. to be represented by players who we reared here? Is there any reason for that? Is there any particular need for that? All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we will shift to the Great White North and talk Toronto FC. Michael Bradley, Jermaine Defoe, now TFC players. Curtis Larson from the Toronto Sun joins us in just a second. Soccer Morning, North American Soccer Network, NASN.TV. Welcome back to Soccer Morning on NASN and Kick TV with Jason Davis. Back on Soccer Morning, shifting now to Toronto FC. Big news up there, obviously, the signing of a couple of players. Jermaine Defoe, Michael Bradley, to talk about yesterday's unveiling. Uh, Curtis Larson of the Toronto Sun is on the line. Hi, Curtis. How are you? Yeah, what's going on, man? Uh, we are, uh, we're still kind of analyzing all of the fallout from this. Now, yesterday was the... You know, we, we had rumors. We knew it was happening. We had the spit take videos. That's all fun. We had the, ac- we had the actual men themselves sitting in front of the, 
uh, the assembled press uh, in, in front of some rowdy friends yesterday. Uh, just give me a sense of what that event was like in, in what it you know what it felt like for a club that has so long sort of uh, been in neutral. Uh, I mean, it was an event that 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 was to the magnitude of what those signings were, pretty much. I mean, um, you know, a guy like uh, Jermaine Defoe, people are talking about, well, it's a great signing, but who's going to get him the ball? And then, you know, the wiki kind of a week before goes out and lands Michael Bradley, which kind of boosts the entire uh, deal altogether and, and really just kind of blew everybody out of the water, even though there had been reports about Bradley coming uh, a few weeks in advance. But, I mean, in, in terms of the event, it was star-studded. Uh, Raptors personnel were there. Uh, Dwayne Darius was there. Uh, you know, every MLS executive was there. And it was, it was, you know, the glitz and, and glitter, uh, you know, that I've never seen in this league, having followed it since 1996. And this is, this is undoubtedly the Tim Laiwiki effect. I mean, you know, this is about those guys and what they can do. And certainly TFC fans are anxious to see them on the field, helping uh, the Reds make the playoffs for the first time ever. But how, you know, just sort of, how visible and and how how clear is the impact that Tim Laiwiki has out on this club and and what what is his you know is his presence there in in that room sort of uh, the symbol of a, of a new a new era for TFC? I mean he's 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 kind of in his the way he talks, people said he should be mayor of Toronto you know we have mayor of Florida <laughs> here people are like why isn't Tim Laiwiki the mayor of Toronto listen to this guy up on stage but no I mean like you said this guy's the ultimate entertainer I mean if you just look at how they pursued, you know, Defoe alone, having, you know, a famous rapper, Drake, call him, having David Beckham call him, having Robbie Keane call him, and then going over and meeting face-to-face. And then, you know, Jermaine Defoe told me yesterday that it took him less than an hour to tell his agent after speaking with Lewicki that he was ready to come to MLS and that he was ready to come and be part of something uh, that Lewicki sold him. You know, and, and I think that for, um, uh, and I know that you addressed this as well, the the response out of England, certainly the, the Guardian column by Daniel Taylor, uh, Tyler, Taylor, excuse me, Taylor, uh, got a lot of response in, in the sense that, that at least from Jermaine Defoe's perspective, it's all about money and, and it's easy to be cynical about this. And the same thing from, uh, from Michael Bradley, especially for U.S. men's national team fans who, for whatever reason, still need him to be in Europe and fly in that flag. Um, there's, there's something else clearly at work here. Is that the Laiwiki factor? Do you think it's, um, you know, d- would anybody else have been able to sell these guys on this project? Yeah, just to be just to be clear on that, I mean the dealer that 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 Darby uh, article, I wasn't so much commenting on what he said about the photo, rather what he said about TFC and sure. uh, it's a horrible club because it clearly didn't go over what you know Tim Bezuchenko and Loki have done this offseason and bringing in Justin Moreau, bringing in Jackson, bringing in Darisario at reduced rates. Um, you know, so so pretty much I was just correcting that part of that article. But uh, you know, there's something about Tim Loki and his ability to sell somebody on on dream. Um, you know, the front page of, of our sports section today said, you know, dream big. And, and that's what Lewicki is all about. He's about telling these guys that they're going to be a part of something special if they come here. And, oh, by the way, here's $30 million for you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the other thing here as we, uh, you know, we sort of watched the event unfold, um, you know, both these guys had, had recently arrived in town. I mean, Jermaine Defoe uh, saw a little bit of video of him at the airport. Michael Bradley kind of maybe snuck into the city a little bit more, uh, certainly within, you know, certainly his personality would lend you to believe he'd rather not be approached by cameras at the airport. What would, you know, just in, in, in any one-on-one time you got with them or, or them with, with them on stage responding to the fans, you know, how did you, what kind of sense did you get from them? Because clearly it's not real until they're in that moment. Uh, you know, I, I felt like Michael was a little bit more deer in headlights. It looked like the deal was a little bit more, um, fresh to him, new to him. I think he, he just decided on this move, you know, within weeks. I mostly spoke with Jermaine Defoe yesterday. My colleague was with Bradley, but Defoe, he really got the sense that this is a guy who wants to come over and prove that he's one of the best players in MLS or is the best player in MLS. And he thinks, yeah, he still has the ability to go to a World Cup. He says he knows what, he knows what, uh, he knows Roy Hodgson knows what he offers. He, he said he's 31. He has World Cup appearances. He has, he has good best caps. Um, so, you know, you don't get the sense this is a guy coming over to, um, you know, just like a paycheck. It's something that he wants to experience, but at the same right. time, he wants to showcase to this league that he is a top player and, and could still be a top player in the Premier League if he wanted to. Uh, let's let's go to the practical issues that, that TFC faces. I mean, you mentioned some, mentioned some of the additions, Justin Morrow uh, bringing in uh, bringing back Dwayne uh, Dorosario on a on a lesser salary than he's uh, he's been used to the last couple of years. Obviously, these two guys, big DP signings. Uh, there's Gilberto's in the mix. We assume that. Uh, 
that uh, Lava is out the door here very, very quickly. Um, but from, from a competitive perspective, and, and there's still some work to be done uh, in terms of acquisitions, but from a co- competitive perspective, how much better is TFC right now than they were when they shut down at the end of 2013? <laughs> well, I mean, going back to 2013, this was a roster that, um, you, you know, it, it would have struggled to compete in, in the USL or win the USL. I mean, this is a roster that was decimated by injury. Kuhn has never played the entire season. Of course, Frings was out. Um, you know, the back line was improved, but there were still, you know, rookie holds back there with Ashton Morgan at left back. And, you know, Richard Eckersley was out the door at right back. And it, it's a roster that, um, you know, Ryan Nelson probably doesn't even believe what he has on his hands right now compared to what he had three months ago. You know, like you said, there are still some holes. Um, I'm not sure it's championship caliber yet. Um, but, you know, if Ryan Nelson doesn't get this team to the playoffs, then he's probably going to have some problems at the end of the season. Yeah, that's the question. Um, you know, I, I, I wonder about the leash on Ryan Nelson. I mean, he's clearly a holdover from the, the, the last um, regime with, uh, with Kevin Payne having handpicked him. And I think that most of the doubts that, that revolve around uh, TFC right now, as they have dramatically increased the level of talent in that club, is, is what Ryan Nelson can do. Is he able to handle this? Um, is, it, is, it, is, this is, he, is this job bigger than him at this point? I mean, that sounds odd from an MLS perspective, but it, it, it might be. I, mean, I don't think so. I mean, he's a big personality. He's captained some big clubs in England. He's been to a World Cup. He's made, an, he's made a best 11 at a World Cup. Um, but, you know, if he doesn't get this club to the playoffs, then... Um, you know, there's going to be some decisions to make. There's some thinking out there that maybe he was kept on as part of the Defoe deal because, you know, Defoe was comfortable with him as a manager. Defoe knows him. Defoe and him are friends. They text each other. Um, so maybe that kind of played into, you know, uh, Bezuchenko deciding to keep him because he decimated the entire staff. He, you know, Payne was out and everybody underneath him was out. So, um, you know, I don't think the job is bigger than him. Um, I think, like I said, uh, he's been a part of some, some big groups and some big personalities and he's managed that just fine. Um, there was a, a little bit of talk out of um, out of this news yesterday, as it became official that Michael Bradley was was part of uh, this big splashing of cash on TFC's part. That that TFC has ruined the market a little bit. That that inflation will now kick in when other MLS teams go out to look for for DP caliber players. Did, was that addressed at all yesterday by by either Lewicki or Be- De- uh, Bezbachenko or anybody there? And and really, do you believe that that's a, a knock on effect of of what they've done here? No, I mean it wasn't addressed at all yesterday, and I kind of think that's just searching for something to be negative about in a day that was, you know, really a landmark day uh, in MLS history. Did they maybe overpay for Defoe? Possibly, um, Bradley. Well, they're paying him significantly more than he was making at his last job. Um, but at the same time, if these deals weren't made, and if you know a club like the TFC and and you know ownership MLSC wasn't willing to go out and make this big of a splash, then you know, fans would be complaining about something else that, you know, that, that MLS is not willing to open up the pocketbook and go out. So, uh, you know, I don't really buy that that much. That's just kind of searching for, for something to complain about um, on a day that I think we'll even, uh, you know, at least remember in this city for, for a long time to come. Um, I, I saw some numbers. I don't know how accurate they were about the, uh, the response to these signings um, from the season ticket fan base there at, in Toronto. Um, it, it, was there a massive response here? I mean, was it, was it, you know, we've sold out our season tickets in an hour because we've got Defoe and Bradley or, or something in that realm? I mean, I, th- I think there was a steady response already just based on, you know, how the club was talking, you know, how confident people are in Tim Bezvichenko and his ability to navigate this league and, and do things right in a, in a cap system. Um, you know, I, th- I think in, in terms of numbers, you know, Lewicki told me yesterday that, that he was expecting the club to sell out of its uh, 17,000 uh, season ticket allotment uh, before the end of this week, which would, which would leave, uh, I guess, four or 5,000 open tickets per game or, or partial packs. Um, but he also said that he ex- uh, every game this season at BMO Field to be sold out. Whether that's true, we'll find out. You know, who knows if scalpers are buying some of these tickets and who knows what, uh, what, uh, if it'll be a sea of red at BMO next season. Was any of the was the, the any of the practical aspects of, of these two guys and the uh, sort of the where they are in their careers was was any of that discussed? I mean, Jermaine Defoe, you know whether or not Roy Hodgson, uh, you know, rates MLS or not, is still a candidate to make the England World Cup team. We know Michael Bradley will be in the U.S. World Cup team. These guys could potentially miss some some time. I know the MLS is, that MLS is taking a two week break for the for the group stages, but you know they could spend a ton of money and then have these guys be on, be there for only three quarters of the time. Is that an issue? Yeah, I think it's a concern this season, but don't forget Defoe's on a four-year deal and, and, and Bradley's on a six-year deal, so they're going to be here for some time to come, and I guess Bradley will even miss maybe another World Cup in, uh, 
in 2018. Right. So, uh, you know, it's a concern in the sense that you're going to be missing probably your two most important players. But that's why you bring in a guy like Zerberto. That's why you bring in a guy like De Rosario. Uh, they still have some depth signings to make. Uh, Lil Wiki on, on uh, a local radio station last night said they're actually uh, in talks with Roma to get a lone player or two. So that'll be something uh, to watch in the next few weeks uh, to see if they can get some depth uh, that way. Uh, let, let me ask you, let me, we'll go out with this. Uh, uh, we mentioned uh, Dwayne De Rosario coming back to TFC. We know it went bad the last time around. We had the, the check signing celebration and, and, and sort of pushing his way out the door and ending up getting traded twice that year. He is a guy, I, I like him as a player. He's probably in top two or three of uh, MLS all-time players. But he's a guy that's used to being the, 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 the big man on campus, Curtis. And He's not going to be now, and, and it's, it's pretty clear he's going to be third or fourth or fifth on that pecking order. Can he be you know, uh, just a part of the machine rather than the guy that's leading the charge? I think he can be, and I think that goes back to what you said about Nelson, the importance of Nelson kind of keeping this locker room in check and, 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 and you know, managing attitudes, managing players differently. But at the same time, I think De Rosario is motivated more so than maybe he ever has been, especially after a down year. Um, you know, big signings coming in. He wants to prove that he's still you know, a goat in this pack. He said he wouldn't be playing still if he didn't think he could be a number one guy in this attack. Um, you know, there are concerns with that. Um, you know, what if he, you know, leads the team in the scoring this year and then comes back to them next year and says, well, I'm leading the team in scoring. You know, why are you paying this guy $5 million a year? Right. Um, that's something they'll have to face down the road. But uh, at, at the moment, uh, everything seems uh, seems okay with that. And, and both, uh, sorry, De Rosario seems happy to be here. Is this, um, for as long as you've been covering TFC and, and MLS in Toronto, is this the, uh, the most fun time that you've had so far? Is it Has it ever been this good? Yeah, I got to be honest, man. I've loved my job ever since I started doing it two or three years ago. Uh, you know, good times or bad times. I'm still covering soccer for a living, so it doesn't matter if a team's doing well or, or, uh, or, or bad. There's always something to write about in this city. Uh, and, and the fans obviously excited up there in Toronto. It's going to be a fascinating year for Toronto FC. Michael Bradley, Jermaine Defoe now in the fold. Tim Iwicki with the, uh, the big checkbook and Tim, Tim Bezbachenko making that team over. Curtis Larson from the Toronto Sun joining us talking to FC. Thanks for your time, Curtis. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, anytime. See ya. All right. Talk to you later. Uh, we, got a, yeah, we got a little bit of time left in this show on a Tuesday soccer morning, North American Soccer Network. Uh, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm monitoring Twitter. A multitasker in the show, people. You have to. Getting all of that information about TFC from Curtis Larson, who's on the ground. Apparently, his, his paper, the Toronto Sun, had like some massive spread about uh, Toronto uh, FC as they, as they bring, it, bring in two, uh, two big-time players, spend $100 million. Uh, the, what I'm seeing on Twitter here is that uh, with Marisa Du considering a return to MLS, and perhaps already in negotiations with MLS to, uh, to, to come back, that... The trade that, that just happened, I, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, Jeff Park from the Philadelphia Union uh, to, uh, to D.C. United for the, the first allocation spot, um, and there may have been something else involved, I'm not sure, um, that Marisa do, despite the fact he will be on a DP salary and be a DP contract, question about that in a, in a second, will we'll go through the allocation process while guys like Clint Dempsey and Michael Bradley did not. And if they're all DPs, they, I'm confused. MLS, what are you doing? Uh, Philippe's on the line. What's up, Philippe? Hey, Jason. How are you? I'm good. What's up? Uh, well, just wanted to uh, maybe talk about Toronto FC. Okay. Uh, because it's our biggest rival. Uh, yeah. Well, by we, the way, we, Philippe, how many players have the Philadelphia? I'm sorry, Philadelphia. How many players have the Montreal Impact added this offseason? season? Uh, that's exactly why I'm ta- I'm uh, actually <laughs> calling right now. <laughs> Zero is the answer. Zero, Philippe. Yeah, it's the the answer is zero. And um, funny fact, uh, yesterday I've watched the uh, I, I've actually looked at the um, salary cap uh, for last year for last season. Okay. Uh, because actually Nick Descent is the uh, the uh, G, uh, not the GM but the technical director. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Um, actually went in the media and, and said to the media that uh, the team uh, doesn't have enough money. They have to go to the super draft and take some. Uh, some uh, not uh, too high on the uh, salary cap players. Sure. Okay. And uh, the funny thing is that I've actually looked at the salary cap from last season. And with all the movement that they did, they actually did some movement in the off season, but not bringing player in, just taking player out. Um, they actually cleared 935000 on the salary cap. 
I know that they actually re-sign some player or maybe uh, give some extension to some players. Sure, and, and guys have built-in uh, bumps in their contract. So remember that. Yeah, so yeah. They, they have they, they probably paid a little bit more, but with all the transparency <laughs> that we have in the MLS, we can't know about... You have no uh, idea. Nick DeSantis can say that, and you have no idea. You can do the math, but you're, gonna, yeah. but you're probably going to be wrong, Philly. Yeah, exactly. But the thing is that I'm pretty sure... That they that the the contract that they actually extend to some players uh, will never reach the nine hundred and thirty five thousand dollar that they have cleared on the cap. Okay, but other that's, thing. Okay, still not a lot of money. That, that's no, what, that's I know, one I mean, good decent if, play. If a, if a DP, I mean, if they're ready for a DP, because I, I there they had some rumors about uh, G- uh Gilardino or something like that, uh-huh. the Genoa player. Right. Like, yes. That you, they wanted to pay three million dollar for him and stuff like that. Okay. Um, the thing is that. They probably have some space to get some player. That's for sure. I mean, yeah, okay. yeah, they extend some players. And the thing that I'm thinking about is maybe because they actually paid for the third DP spot. Okay, so that might be. A, I don't know if the if the third DP spot, the 250 bucks that they pay for it. I don't know if it's uh, actually put on the salary cap or it's just the team that's playing that's yeah, paying. Look, for it. I, I understand you're just you're just frustrated at this point, Philippe. Yeah, like kind that. of. Well, and it's not. It's actually because the Toronto have made some really really good addition to to their team. Um, really good for them. They're they're our big rival. We hate we hate them, but at the same time, it's a Canadian team. Right. Uh, they're building a, a really good a, a really good team right now. It, it's really good to see that, but it's frustrating to see that. Like our biggest rival for the Concacaf run uh, is is putting some player in, and uh, that we w- w- that our team is doing absolutely yeah, the, nothing the, right now. The, so the Neutralite Voyagers Cup Canadian Championship, or whatever the heck you guys call that thing, because it's got like a thousand. <laughs> I think it's eight. the Amway. Oh, is it Amway now? Okay. Oh uh, yeah. yeah, I think so. <laughs> Uh, well, I wonder what uh, I wonder if Frank Frank Klopas has done since he got that job. I mean, what is he doing? Where is he? Is uh, he yeah? Is he scouting? I, I mean, at least be out there scouting. Uh, I appreciate the call, Philippe. I I under- understand your frustration. Uh, <laughs> F- Philippe got in on Skype, by the way. If you want to do that, uh, NASN Soccer, I think is our Skype name. Is that right? Yes, NASN Soccer. If you want to add us on Skype, if you don't want to mess with the phone line, but if you want to use the old fashioned phone line, it is three four seven seven five six. 6276, got 10 minutes here. Keep the phone lines open uh, for any topics that you might have in mind. A, a couple of things, going back to that immigration, immigration discussion, the, the laws as they exist and the rules that, that U.S. soccer has in place versus uh, U.S. Uh, governmental uh, citizenship laws, naturalization laws. Uh, Boston Red Soccer on Twitter. Uh, lots of good inf- information here. Green card isn't per- permanent, uh, which is true. And you can get a green card through a lottery, uh, which is the case with Freddie Adu's mom, which is how Freddie Adu ended up in the United States, or because uh, a brother is a U.S. citizen, or by spending uh, money here. If you invest in the United States, you can get a green card. That doesn't necessarily mean you meet the uh, standards for representing the United States in an athletic endeavor. I mean, I I agree with that. Uh, And then he says, FIFA statutes, Article 7, if you get a new nationality, you need to live there five years after turning 18 would still apply um, uh, would apply even uh, for new green cards. So there, there's that as well. Um, it, that is, if that's the FIFA statute, again, five years after the age of 18 in order to get the citizenship. I think, you know, we're seeing that in Mexico. You're seeing players who have been playing in, in uh, uh, the Mexican League for five years that are becoming naturalized citizens, citizens and the question is, will they be integrated into the national team? Uh, blah, blah, blah. 516, you're on the line. Hey, Tyler, how are you doing? Um, I was wondering, is this too my wiki's way of 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 being me, uh, showing how many yogurts uh, covering up his mediocre team in the Ma- in the Maple Leafs, I'm bringing in Bradley and the fellows. It's showing, oh, we're bringing these guys because I want to show you my heart in Toronto, but it's a cover up for his uh, how mediocre his. Maple Leafs well, look, I mean, obviously the Maple Leafs are part of Tim Lightwicky's empire there as he works for MLSC. I don't know that that's a driver of anything he does with his soccer club. I mean, and the guy has incredible, I- incredible aspirations every time he steps into a job. Again, he's the guy that made the impossible thing with David Beckham happen in a lot of ways, in most ways. I mean, they had the league had he, he convinced MLS. At a time when they were incredibly more conservative, the board of governors, the ownership, incredibly more conservative conservative than they are now, he convinced them to loosen the purse strings and allow AEG to go out and bring uh, David Beckham over, which obviously is a snowball that started all of this. I, you know, you know, he, you could argue that 
that they're all interconnected. TFC, the Maple Leafs, the Argos, whatever, whatever MLSC has working for them. But I don't, I don't think that that's, I don't think that's dictating anything he does with Toronto FC. I think that Tim Laiwiki stepped into this job, wants to make winners of all of the teams he has under his umbrella, and TFC and their obvious potential is the reason he is pushing them so quickly with spending $100 million and probably why he was able to convince MLSE to spend the money that they are. Fair enough? Yeah. All right. All right just one more thing. What does what is Marisa do, though? Because it's not Taylor t- 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 and tweet out. He might go to MLS. Um, Marisa do is still a Stoke player for the time being. Um, whether or not uh, he's under contract at the moment, I'm not. I'm not, I really don't have any idea. I mean, I'm sure he could get a release. At some point in the near future, he has yet to step on the field for them in a league game, I don't believe. So, uh, Marisa Du is likely coming back to MLS. Now, the, the thing that's happening here is that um, Stephen Goff of the Washington Post is tweeting that Marisa Du would go through the allocation order, which DC United just traded the top spot to Philadelphia for Jeff Park. He'd go through the allocation order despite being a DP. When we have the precedent of U.S. internationals who sign as DPs, Clint Dempsey and Michael Bradley, not going through the allocation order, which does not jive up why would there be a difference the only possible thing i can think of here and, and jonathan tannenwald said this on twitter a little while ago is that marisa do in the end won't be counted as a dp dp player he'll maybe make a little bit over max salary but he'll his his total will be paid down and he won't count as a dp that's the only thing i can think of as to why he would have to go through the allocation process okay. anything else man? all right thanks a lot appreciate the call marisa do what, what's Marisa Du's value in MLS? I mean, I, I'm not the biggest Marisa Du fan in the world. I'm not. Um, I think he gives the ball away a lot. Uh, I think he's an incredibly athletic guy. Um, he would obviously be a very good MLS player at this point if he's healthy, if he's getting regular time. He, he, would, be an, he would obviously be a very good MLS player. I just don't know what his value is. Uh, and I don't have a sense of what MLS teams are ready to pay for him. I think people are excited because he could help a lot of a lot of clubs, but it you know I I don't I'm not going to get worked up over this. Um, let's see, Brendan Doherty on Twitter uh, giving me uh, giving me some uh, some insight specifically on Diego Fernandez. Uh, Doherty soccer, uh, if I remember correctly, from briefly working with an immigration lawyer in D.C. Because Diego's family overstayed a travel visa visa initially when they came, and because his parents didn't successfully file a waiver at the time, they weren't able to adjust their residency statuses which would have fast-tracked Diego for both permanent residency and citizenship. All right, so we blame his parents. Damn you, Fagundes is. You, damn you. Uh, ex- uh, which, I uh, see, then he says, uh, extraordinary talent in athletics is a priority category for bypassing the residency requirements and the path to citizenship. Yes, and this has happened in uh, Olympic sports. And he says, why can't U.S. soccer make uh, the same claim with Diego? Uh, U.S. soccer, as far as I know, has never utilized that category. In fact, I think that generally speaking, um, the government is loath to give those waivers, to push those, to fast track those citizenship uh, applications for, God, for people that, for men and women, for people who are extraordinarily talented, uh, extraordinarily talented in athletics. And I think that there's just a notion that, you know, American citizenship shouldn't, shouldn't be handed out just because you're good at sports, that you, that there is uh, the, the same hoops that everybody else has to jump through, the same, um, the same requirements that have to be met by the shop owner who, uh, who immigrates from, uh, from China or, or Pakistan or whatever, those should be, the, everybody should be held to those standards. And I'm, I'm for equality and, and egalitarianism on that front. If you are committed to becoming a U.S. citizen, you'll go through the waiting period. If you're, it, it, the, the problem, again, for soccer is that we have these interruptions. If Diego Fagundes, and again, blame his parents if they screwed up, but if Diego Fagundes gets an opportunity in Europe and, and, and ends up in Europe the same way that Yuramov Sifsian did, obviously different ages, but uh, if Yuramov Sifsian, uh, the same way that Yuramov Sifsian did, then his clock stops. And if he's gone long enough, then he no longer is eligible for citizenship in five years and therefore obviously can't represent the United States of America. Uh, it's a problem. It's a problem when you see talented, talent developed in this country that you want to see represent the United States. Isn't that the spirit of international soccer? The United States of America helped make Diego Fagundes the player that he is. We want him to represent us. Logically speaking, it makes sense. But again, if the laws of the land come in conflict with what uh, the spirit of the game or what FIFA says, not even conflict with FIFA, just FIFA, uh, FIFA's rules are not strictly adhered to by the United States. We don't make exceptions, essentially. We don't make exceptions, then it can't happen. All right, the last couple of minutes here. 
you want to sneak in a phone call, you probably have a, uh, a little bit of time. 347-756-6276. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll um, get deeper into this immigration thing down the line. Uh, Trevor on uh, Trevor is telling me that part of the Marisa do designated player allocation order situation is that uh, MLS is not in assisting with the transfer fee, which they did with Bradley and, and Dempsey. Uh, okay, but uh, again, I mean that's that's such a narrow reason for him to be categorized differently. It is. It's murky. It's 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 not. It's not. I don't know. It's MLS. Damn it. Just just. Make things clear and simple for us for a little while. Just just do that. Uh, if you're looking for an update on uh, Juan Agadello, we talked about Marissa Du, Stoke, coming back, probably going to play in MLS very so- shortly, probably going to be a Philadelphia Union player if they have the top spot in the allocation order. Juan Agadello is on the, is, went the other direction. And Juan, Ag- Juan Agadello is still a Stoke player. He still is. And he will be because even though his, uh, his work permit um, hearing came up with him being rejected, it does not cancel out his con- his pre-contract with Stoke. So it looks like they're going to be loaning him out. Uh, Greg Seltzer, excuse me, Greg Seltzer at No Short Corner says probably to Belgium or the Netherlands. So if you're uh, interested in the continuing development of Juan Agudelo, there's that. All right. Uh, reminder, soccermorning.com, which will redirect you to the Indiegogo campaign, is where you need to go if you want to help out the show. Get us started uh, for 2014. It's going to be a gigantic year. Um, we will continue to do our best to bring you um, excellent conversations with excellent people like Richard Dice and Curtis Lar- uh, Deitch and Curtis Larson. Um, we will continue to do this show and give you a voice every day via Colin and Twitter. Uh, we're just going to make it our, our, our goal to be bigger and better. And if you help us out, then that, that can happen uh, as we uh, steam forward into 2014. You can go and help us out on iTunes, by the way, with a rating and a review. They'll get us um, north of some other soccer podcasts. And when people go look for soccer podcasts, they'll find us. There you go. And we have some rewards still available on the Indiegogo campaign as well. So uh, what are the, the uh, Howler Mag, I think there's one or two guest host spots left. There's a DJ spot left, a couple of DJ spots left, something like that. If you want to mess with my music, if you want to mess with my music, go to SoccerMorning.com and check it out and see what you need to do. Because well, let's, apparently we're letting people mess with the music. It's going to be nuts. All right. Again, thank to, thanks to Richard Deitch. Thanks to Curtis Larson. Today was like a C- minus for me today. I, I got to be better. I'll be better tomorrow. Wednesday. Bye. Back in the days on the boulevard, I landed. We used to kick routines and the presence was fitting. It was I, the abstract. And me, the five-footer.